the uh, the mother. I uh, don't have her rank, folks, but uh, her name is Catherine. Catherine uh, Waltvogel. She uh, she grabbed a hold of her three-year-old son Connor, and the video is posted over there at uh, at the Daily Mail, and it's uh, courtesy of K A R E. 11 channel 11 in Min in uh, Minnesota somewhere but uh, go ahead and watch that video it'll warm your heart folks uh, if my uh, narration has not done so already also while you look at the Daily Mail article like I said one should be coming up on, uh, on BuzzPo soon but the Daily Mail has a lot of, uh, of pictures of mother and child and uh, things going on other than just the pictures and the video from the ceremony itself uh, for example um, Catherine uh, Walt Vogel uh, participated in the Boston Marathon um, I'm guessing in 2014 so this year earlier this this year but she did it from Afghanistan so she didn't actually run in Boston she ran the marathon in Afghanistan so you know, hats off to her participating in something like that from uh, half the world away, and she uh, she's standing there with her little medal. There's a good picture of that, so take a good look at that as well. That's the type of uh, that's a quality of parents young Connor has. So great parents, so I'm sure he's gonna he's already being a great kid, so I'm sure he's gonna grow up to be a great American. So go ahead and take a look at that uh, that article. And like I said, keep your eyes on BuzzPo. There should be a a, a similar writer right up being posted on there sometime today other things folks what's going on well it's sunlight time it's time to shed some shed some uh, sunlight on our good old uh, as uh, as uh, Eleanor calls it um, wait a second where's Eleanor this morning is she uh, is she actually in Congress doing her job that would be a miracle she's not interrupting me for once wow just as you I don't want to have a right point. to know everything in a separation Figures. of powers government my friend that is the difference between a parliamentary government and a separation of powers government well when you have the US representative from DC who lives in DC and has been steeped in the corruption of the uh, the entire culture of DC evidently she was raised with a different uh, definition of what separation of powers means than the rest of America so uh, let's uh, let's prove her wrong once again and uh, shed a little light on what's going on in DC uh, folks I don't know if you've been paying much attention recently to a lot of things going on, um, but uh, we have all kinds of interesting things. For one thing, the uh, Department of Homeland Security has suddenly decided that they're an intelligence agency. They're not. In fact, all but one of the intelligence agencies works for the Department of Defense, not Homeland Security. And then the other one, well, doesn't work for any of the above nor the State Department they kind of are kind of sort of their own entity they work for the uh, the National Security Council which is a completely different from Homeland Security and Department of Defense and of course that's the CIA so I don't know where DHS is getting all their great Intel from but they seem to uh, whatever they be telling the public just seems to be having the uh, the curtain pulled down you know we're not just peering behind the curtain but that curtain gets pulled down and whenever it does it it reveals that they're trying to you know give us a smoke screen maybe they're trying to avoid a mass panic which nice try um, there still isn't one but uh, congressman from Utah a man by the name of Jason Chavitz Chavitz C-H-A-F-F-E-T-Z Chavitz he uh he pulled up evidence that on September 10th this year that would be last week folks last Wednesday that uh, four individuals 
linked to ISIS or ISIL or ISIL or Al Qaeda Iraq or Ansar al Sunna or whatever name there. Well, let me step back. AAS or Ansar al Sunna is not the same group as Al Qaeda Iraq. However, when I was in Iraq, they were working together and their political arms were kind of joined and call themselves the Islamic State or the Islamic State of Iraq. So, saying that AAS and AQI make up um, ISIS or part of ISIS or ISIL or ISI or the Islamic State or whatever, that's not far fetched. So, anyway, when you, uh, four people associated with that group infiltrated our border, they came across illegally through Texas, through across the Rio Grande on September 10th. Now they came across and once on this side of the border, they got arrested. They did get snagged up and roped up. So, but that's the four that got caught. How many didn't is a good question. Now Jay Johnson, the current uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, was denying that there were any incursions whatsoever, no infiltrations by, uh, by terrorist linked personnel. Now he's backpedaling and trying to say, oh, I didn't know about that and all kinds of stuff. Now that it's been revealed that he lied to the American people. Well, maybe he didn't lie. He may not have known. So the question is, did he lie to us or is he incompetent? Because he wants you to think that he was incompetent now or that his people hid it from him, which would still make him incompetent as a leader. Anyway, um, the article, again, is up over at BuzzPo, and it's... Uh, uh, Chavitz, four terrorists caught at border. So go ahead and take a look at that article. Now, since we're discussing the whole ISIS thing and the thing going on in Syria and the increased uh, aggression in Iraq and trying to figure out what we're going to do about it, and, uh, and of course, Obama giving his proposal plans and getting bipartisan support, and he's still saying, I'm not going to put boots on the ground to hold key terrain, but uh, wants to continue airstrikes, etc. He can declare war if he wanted to right now, go, no, right now, folks, because uh, he has bipartisan support to do so. But uh, he's acting within the War Powers Act, and of course, there's some people and they're squawking that he's violating it, um, which is not entirely true. And uh, and even if he is, nothing's going to be done about it. Um, and I have uh, Dan Joseph. Um, He's done some work from uh, MRC, for MRC and a couple other outlets out there. And he's got a video up on his channel over on YouTube, and I've got the audio for it. And he discusses the War Powers Act and the reality of uh, what it'll actually do. So let's take a little listen to what, uh, what Mr. Dan Joseph ha has to say about the War Powers Act. Powers Act. What is good for? Absolutely. Say again, y'all. Hey, kids. You would be absolutely shocked by how many useless laws we have on the books in this country. Laws that seemingly have no reason to exist and could never actually be enforced. For example, in the state of Georgia, you may not keep a donkey in a bathtub. Hmm. In New Hampshire, it is considered an offense to throw pickle juice on a trolley. Fascists. And in Utah, it is illegal not to drink milk because Mormons will not stand for lactose intolerance in their state. But perhaps none of these dumb state laws are as useless as one big federal law, and that's the War Powers Act. Now, libertarians, please stop throwing Ron Paul buttons at your computer screen and let me explain. I didn't say it was a bad law, just useless, like voting for a candidate from the Libertarian Party. Over the last few days, the administration has been falling all over itself when it comes to answering questions about whether our actions against ISIS in Iraq and Syria are acts of war or not. Now, this may seem like a silly and unnecessarily evasive tactic. After all, this administration has no problem calling it a war on women. But the truth is that what the administration calls this military action does in fact matter. And there are also questions resurfacing about what the president can use the military for and for what reasons and whether he needs congressional approval to do so in the first place. And this is where the War Powers Act comes into play. The War Powers Act or War Powers Resolution was passed in 1973. It says
says that the president can only send U.S. armed forces into action abroad by declaration of war by Congress, statutory authorization, or in case of a national emergency created by an attack upon the United States. The War Powers Act requires the president to notify Congress within 48 hours of committing armed forces to military action. But it also gives the president some wiggle room. He's allowed to take military action without congressional approval for 60 days. And then he gets another 30 days to get the troops out if he doesn't get Congress to go along with him. There's only one problem with this law. No president has ever given two shits about it. After Vietnam, Congress swore it would never again be duped into war and even wrote a new law, the War Powers Act to ensure it would not repeat its mistakes. At least not once they become president. And I'm not just talking about Obama here. The law was passed by overriding the veto of President Nixon. So while technically a legitimate law, the War Powers Act was never actually signed by a sitting president. The intention of the law was to prevent America from entering into future protracted military engagements like Vietnam had become without the consent of Congress. Since the War Powers Act was passed, every single president has ignored it on at least one occasion, claiming that they have the authority to engage in military action whether Congress likes it or not. Presidents of both parties do not view the War Powers Act as constitutional and therefore believe that they are under no obligation to abide by it. And they have a really sneaky, clever way of getting around it. The big loophole comes from the fact that when the Founding Fathers wrote up the Constitution, they gave Congress the power to declare war. But they never really clearly defined what war was. So a lot of presidents decided, okay, well I just won't call my use of military action war. Problem solved. That's pretty convenient. I wish we could change the name of the Star Wars prequels to something else and pretend they didn't count as part of the story. Jar Jar's Big Adventure. No, 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 wait, 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 don't go. Since World War II, we've been involved in five major military conflicts and many minor engagements without ever declaring war. The Union didn't even officially declare war on the Confederacy during the Civil War. Some people still contend that the Civil War was an illegal war. Like these guys. <laughs> but since that War Powers Act was passed, the president better watch out because if he takes military action without congressional approval, you know what Congress will do to him? Nothing. They'll do nothing. They'll yell for a while on TV in the floor of Congress, then they'll go have a sandwich and head back to their district for the ribbon cutting of a new Chipotle. So, is the War Powers Act constitutional or not? This seems like a job for these guys! Da -da 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 -da. The Supreme Court, yay! They'll settle this once and for all. Nope. The court views this matter as a political question, not a legal one. And the court does not get involved in ruling on political debates between the different branches of government. If Congress thinks that the president is breaking the law, well, that's what impeachment is there for. Hmm, try and impeach the president for using the military to fight bad guys. Yeah, good luck with that. Traditionally, there are two groups of Americans who love the War Powers Act. Libertarians, and whichever party is not in control of the White House. And that's another thing that has rendered the War Powers Act totally irrelevant. Politicians selectively bring it up depending on which party the president at the time is a member of. If you're a congressman and the president is a member of your own party, you might let it slide. But if the president is in the opposite party, chance are that that same congressman is going to be screaming like a little girl who just discovered a spider colony in her closet. So, the president doesn't see the War Powers Act as legitimate. Congress only selectively evokes it based on political considerations, the Supreme Court won't rule on it, and the vast majority of the American people are like, Hey Paul, come look at this here cat riding on this vacuum cleaner. <laughs> As a result, lawmakers have never successfully used the War Powers Act to end any military mission. Due to the consistent refusal of presidents of both parties to abide by the War Powers Resolution and Congress's refusal to force them to with the threat of impeachment or cutting off funding for the military action, an irreversible precedent has been set. So if Joe Biden somehow became president, Hi, Dios mio. And he decided that he was going to launch missiles at the moon because he read in Mad Magazine that there are space ninjas hiding there planning an attack on the factory where Skittles are made. <laughs> Sorry, Congress. Joe Biden's going to attack those moon ninjas and you can't do anything about it. Now, some view this refusal of the executive branch to submit to Congress's will on the use of the military a very dangerous thing. And maybe they're right. But look at it from the president's point of view metaphorically. As president, you're the one who gets the blame if American interests in the world come under attack. And when the second coming of the Taliban shows up and starts lopping off American journalists' heads, no one blames Senator Bernie Sanders or Rand Paul. The president always takes the political hit if Americans are being abducted overseas, or if brutal dictators decide to invade neighboring countries to steal their resources in a way that will impact the U.S. economy. And let's say the president uses up the 60-day window the War Powers Act gives him to take military action. What if he ends 
up needing more time to complete it. Is he supposed to withdraw troops in the middle of a conflict because 535 idiots in Congress can't come to a decision and then put them back in later if they finally vote to authorize him? No. Dumb. It's totally irresponsible to let 535 guys who pass bills that they don't even read, and some of whom probably don't even know how to read, dictate military action after he's already taken it. At this point, asking for congressional authorization is just symbolic. If Congress had consistently spoke in one unified voice in defense of the War Powers Act over the last 40 years, things might be different. Because it's pretty clear that the founders wanted Congress to have at least some say in when the president could take military action. But as we all know, Congress is bad at doing stuff, and these are the consequences. I'm Dan Joseph. Please click on the red widget to subscribe, visit my Facebook page, and also occasionally I make an appearance on Steve Gutowski's blog, Games and Guns. It combines politics, guns, and video games. It's very unique. There's nothing else like it on the internet. You need to check it out, and you can do so by clicking right here. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. And thanks, Dan Joseph, for uh, those words of wisdom or the, your take on the uh, War Powers Act and why or why not. It'll never really be enforced. So, uh, And uh, to counter that, well, not really counter that, but to kind of go along with that, um, Bill Whittle uh, recently released another one of his videos on, uh, I think it's on Reveal Politics. I need to look it up exactly where. But it's his firewall videos, and he has his latest firewall where he compares our current president with our last president. So let's take a, a quick listen. Well, not so quick listen. It's about the same length as the uh, last bit of audio there. But let's give a listen to uh, Bill Whittle's take on uh, Bush versus uh, Bush light. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle, and this is The Firewall. Well, recently, President Obama, when told that airstrikes alone very likely would not be enough to stop the murderous sight of ISIS as it destroys entire ethnic populations on his watch, has told his Joint Chiefs that he would make a decision about deploying U.S. ground forces, quote, on a case-by-case -case basis, unquote. What does that mean? Nobody really knows. He doesn't really know either, but what it sounds like is that we may need to send troops on specific missions against specific targets, as in on a police raid. But this is in no way to be construed as boots on the ground. If Barack Obama has to deploy U.S. Marines to Iraq wearing flip-flops so that he can claim he didn't put boots on the ground, then that is what he is going to do. Anything other than admit that an ongoing campaign of airstrikes and troops on the ground is, in fact, you know, war. Because... Barack Obama is against war. He's launching airstrikes and deploying soldiers and killing people, but this is not war. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, is there anybody left out there who doesn't see this progressive president doing the exact same thing as that swaggering Texas cowboy George W. Bush, and not only doing the same things, but not doing them nearly as well? Is there anybody out there who once voted for Captain Hope and Change who doesn't see that he's broken not just every progressive promise, but every progressive gospel, and done it late, and done it badly? Anybody out there who doesn't see this empty suit for what he is, namely Bush light? No? Well, where do we begin? How about if we start with Executive Order 13492, Review and Disposition of Individuals Detained at the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base and Closure of Detention Facilities. Barack Obama was sworn into office on January 20, 2009. Two days later, on January 22nd, he signed the Executive Order authorizing the closure of the detention base at Guantanamo Bay. President Bush understood the need for such a secure facility far from American soil because of the dangers of a large-scale rescue attempt of so many high-value terrorists. Bush Light, on the other hand, called Gitmo a stain on America's honor. Still open, though. You know why? Well, because, as it turns out, there's a need for such a secure facility far from American soil because of the dangers of a large-scale rescue attempt of so many high-value terrorists. That's why. So. Bush Light keeps it open in violation of his own order. Hey, speaking of Gitmo, President Bush assumed the responsibility and the concomitant waves of criticism of ordering the extraordinary rendition, that's waterboarding, of a very small number of top terrorists 
that belong to al-Qaeda. One of these, the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, KSM, who not only admitted to, but in fact bragged about the murder of more than 3,000 American civilians, broke 